Good evening to you all. I'm, I'm pleased to announce Adrienne Roberts, a lecturer in international politics at the University of Manchester. Her fields of research include international and feminist political economy. She's currently working on topics uh, of gender, debt, finance, and financialization. Adrienne is the author of the book Gender States of Punishment and Welfare, Feminist Political Economy, Primitive Accumulation, and the Law. In today's lecture, she will draw, uh, draw attention to a gendered racialized dimensions of the criminalization of poverty. Starting with a brief historical overview, she will continue by addressing an important issue, the growing reliance of households on debt as a means of financing the costs of social reproduction. Adrienne, the floor is your, yours. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Thanks for inviting me, and I'm really happy to be here with everyone uh, today at this festival, which seems like a wonderful event, and I wasn't able to come two years ago when you invited me, so I'm glad to finally be here. As uh, Carolina said, I was going to talk to you today about a book that I've published recently, um, Gendered States of Punishment and Welfare. And I've been thinking about the contents of that book and the extent to which they translate for this sort of audience. So in the book, I talk about the Anglo-American countries in particular. So the argument that I make is really about the development of Anglo-American capitalism in the United States, Canada, and the United Kingdom. But I think that a lot of the arguments that I'm going to make both theoretically and to a certain extent empirically, will speak to some broader issues that I think will resonate with some of you here. So some of the issues that I'm going to talk about are related to, for instance, the prolonged attack on social reproduction that has been taking place over the past several decades, and I'll explain what I mean by that in a little while. But we've seen this throughout the history of neoliberalism, the undermining, privatizing of social reproduction, and particularly after the introduction of austerity measures in recent years, we've really seen the intensification of not only class divisions, but also very particular gendered and, and racial divisions. So I'm going to talk a little bit about some of that territory that might be more familiar to some of you. But then I also wanted to spend some time talking about things that are much less frequently discussed at these sort of events. And this has to do with the ways in which the people who are most disadvantaged by policies, by neoliberal uh, and by capitalist economic policies and by broader political economic processes, they tend to be treated as if they are the ones who are the problem. So I'm going to talk about how particular groups of people are produced as a criminalized class in different moments of capitalist development. Um, I'm a critical feminist scholar, so I particularly want to draw attention to some of the gendered dimensions of the criminalization of poverty. As I said, I'm, I'm aware, so I work in the area of political economy, and this sort of focus on criminalization, on policing, on the state's criminal apparatus, isn't something that political economists have tended to spend a lot of time thinking about. But the argument that I'm making here is that the state, through a combination of its criminal justice apparatus and its social welfare apparatus, play an integral role in securing capitalist relations of production and social reproduction, which are both highly gendered. So again, the starting point for my research focuses on trends that have been taking place in the Anglo-American countries. And I'm sure that most of you are aware of some of the statistics around the prison population of the United States. So America is just a, an exceptional case when it comes to locking up its population. And, and there's been a lot of attention paid to the racialized dimensions of America's carceral sort of a problem. But we actually see an intensification of criminalization. We see growing incarceration rates taking place globally. Um, across many parts of the world. So in the past two decades, 
prison populations have grown by 50% or more in over 50 countries, uh, including Croatia. So this is sort of a global type of a trend. What tends to receive very little attention is the fact that women actually constitute the fastest growing segment of this prison population. So even though women constitute a very small proportion of prison populations overall, their rate of incarceration globally is actually growing at a faster rate than men's rate is. So just to give you the quick statistic on that, the female incarceration rate, just looking at the years between 2006 and 2012, it grew by 16% and in the Americas by 23%. So you just see quite a phenomenal increase in women's incarceration. But I'm not just interested in, in incarceration rates, so this isn't just about particular groups of people being locked up, but I'm interested in a broader trend that has involved the growing criminalization and policing and punishment of particular groups of people. And there are lots of different examples that we can use to exemplify this growing uh, disciplinary dimension of state power. So thinking about all the different ways in which the state has increasingly um, penalized and published and punished particular groups of people. One example from the UK, uh, where I live now, so in the 1990s, the UK government introduced what we call ASBOs. So these are antisocial uh, behavior orders. And what ASBOs do is give particular local authorities the ability to punish a whole series of kind of vaguely defined disorderly behaviors. So anything from um, panhandling to drinking in public and those types of things were criminalized and now treated um, by the, the police as being a criminal type of a problem. Even more recently than that, in 2014, the UK created what are called public spaces protection orders, so PSBOs. And these are similar to ASBOs, but they're specifically designed to enable the authorities to ban or regulate any activity conducted in a public space that's considered to be a nuisance. So it's giving local authorities further powers to criminalize behavior in particular public spaces. So some examples of how these orders are being used They've been used to restrict sleeping in public places. They've been used to limit begging, prohibit the consumption of alcohol, to ban music and busking in public places, to prohibit spitting, to limit swearing, to prevent 16-year-olds from gathering in groups of three or more, and to regulate dress. So you really see this massive intensification of the power of the state to regulate people's behavior uh, I would argue, in the name of creating spaces conducive to the accumulation of capital. There are plenty of other examples that we can use, but I'm going to just sort of move ahead with the argument that I'm trying to make here. What I argue in this book, so in one sentence, the kind of key argument is that the capitalist state has throughout its history used its criminal justice apparatus in conjunction with its social welfare apparatus. So I really see these two aspects of the state as being integrally connected. And the state has used these to secure capitalist relations of production and social reproduction. So again, even though some of the things that I'm going to talk about are quite specific to trends that are taking place in the Anglo-American countries. I think it would be useful to keep in mind the move toward uh, violent forms of policing and the criminalization of poverty, which we've seen in Europe, uh, things that have been intensified in the wake of the migrant crisis, and again, through austerity, um, et cetera, et cetera. So, what I try to do in this particular book is give a historical account of how the state uses this criminal justice apparatus and the social welfare apparatus from the very early transition to capitalism in the 16th and 17th century up until the current period. 
And obviously, I'm not going to cover all of that sort of history here, but I am going to focus a little bit on some of the historical dimensions of this, because the argument that I make about how this aspect of state power is mobilized historically forms a part of my uh, theoretical framework. So I think making this historical argument helps to explain how my particular approach to feminist historical materialism understands what capitalism really is, for what it's all about. So I'm going to talk a bit about the historical aspect. Um, and then the other part that I really want to draw attention to here is the role that these aspects of state power play in creating and securing gender relations. So this is something that gets left out of the existing literature that is there on the governance of <coughs> criminalization. So I want to focus on the gendered aspects and in particular on the role of the state in creating and securing relations of social reproduction. So to start with some aspects of the historical argument here, I think that we're given the tools to be able to identify how the state uses these forms of coercive power by Karl Marx in his writings on the primitive accumulation of capital. So when Marx is writing in Capital Volume 1 about the primitive accumulation of capital, the basic argument that he's making is that the transition to capitalism was not a smooth transition. Um, it was not a peaceful transition. Capitalism didn't naturally come after other forms of economic organization. But actually, capitalism was the result of a series of violent and highly contested social transformations that took place in the 17th and 18th centuries. So the argument that Karl Marx is making is that with the transition to capitalism, we get a couple of qualitative shifts in social form. And the state is central in bringing about these qualitative shifts in social form. And what he means by that, and, and what I draw on, are namely the commodification <coughs> of land, so the creation of private property, and, and all of the laws and um, forms of, of state power that are used to create and secure private property are one aspect of this qualitative shift to capitalism. And the other has to do with the commodification of labor. So the actual creation of the working class relies on the state and all of these legal mechanisms. So going back to this writing of Karl Marx in uh, his section in his writings on primitive accumulation, I argue that the law, including the various means used to enforce the law, so forms of policing and punishment, was itself a central mechanism of the primitive accumulation of capital. So the laws used to coercively create the conditions necessary for capitalist production and accumulation to take place. So again, focusing in particular on the commodification of land and labor, um, some examples of this, I mean, the state sanctioned enclosure movements in England are obviously central to the creation of private property. But at the same time, the state uh, erects a number of new laws that criminalize behavior that was formally thought to be kind of the customary behavior of the peasantry. So the state creates new laws that, for instance, prevent the peasantry from hunting deer on private property. So this is now punishable by death. The state creates laws that prevent the peasantry from being able to collect berries and woods in the forest. They're not, peasantry is not allowed to fish in ponds and things like this. So you get all of these legal mechanisms that are part of the very creation of private property and which result in the criminalization of all of these customary behaviors of the peasantry. Between the years of 1688 and 1820, there are about 150 new capital statutes that are created in England, which are concerned with offenses against property. So this is a massive state-sanctioned um, move to create private property. So this argument is an argument that has been raised by particular Marxist historians, 
um, namely people like Douglas Hay and E.P. Thompson writing in the 1970s and 80s. And I go back and resurrect some of these arguments, but I think that while a lot of this work really draws attention to how the, the law becomes central to the creation of private property and wage laborers, they tend to assume that the peasantry is this homogenous type of group who are all disciplined to engage in wage work in the same sort of a way. And I think from a feminist perspective, we can't understand capitalism purely in terms of these imperatives designed to create a class of wage laborers. So we can't just think about capitalism in terms of the social relations of production or in terms of class relations. So feminists uh, and feminist political economists have drawn attention to the ways in which capitalist relations of production uh, are accompanied by, they operate alongside particular capitalist relations of social reproduction. And these might overlap, so it's, there's not always a clear distinction between these two sets of social relations, and they're often in tension. But to give you a sense of what I mean by relations of social reproduction, for people who aren't familiar with this literature, um, feminists disagree sort of about how to frame this, how to think about it, how to define it, but I follow the definition provided by Isabella Bakker, who's a, uh, another Canadian uh, political economist, and she defines social reproduction as involving three particular sets of social relations. So it involves the social relations of biological reproduction, so the actual reproduction of the species, and the social constructions uh, of motherhood. The second set of social relations here involves the reproduction of the labor force, including its socialization and training. And the third set of social relations involves the reproduction of provisioning and caring needs. And these social relations can be uh, wholly privatized. They can be relations. This can be work that's done within the private nuclear family. It can be work that's done through the market mechanism. It can be work that is supported by the state and is socialized. And really, the, that aspect of social reproduction, so whether it's done by the family, the market, or the state, has historically been an important aspect of feminist social struggle. So going back to this history of primitive ac accumulation then, feminists have argued that if we put relations of social reproduction at the center of the analysis, then we see that in the transition to capitalism, the historical process of divorcing the producer from the means of production and the transformation of immediate producers into wage laborers also involves a whole range of mechanisms that are designed to create a gendered division of labor based on the spatial separation of production and social reproduction. It involves measures that are designed to relegate the work of social reproduction to the private household and to materially and discursively devalue this work. So what I'm interested in doing then is looking at the ways in which the state actually creates these divisions and this form of devaluation through its legal apparatus. And this is similar in a way to an argument that is made by Silvia Federici, who in uh, her 2004, I think, book, Caliban and the Witch, uh, argues that the mechanisms of the primitive accumulation of capital, so these mechanisms involved in creating capitalism, she argues that they should be viewed as helping to enclose the female body, which restricts women's control over the biological reproduction of the labor force and gives greater power to capital and the state over this process. So in her writing in this book, Caliban and the Witch, Silvia Federici uses the example of the great witch hunt of the 16th and the 17th centuries, which resulted in the execution of hundreds of thousands of women throughout Europe. And this witch hunt, she argues, helped to destroy the social power of women, to demonize behaviors that <clears throat> did not fit with the emerging capitalist work discipline, and to criminalize sexuality for non-procreative purposes. So for instance, uh, we see the criminalization of homosexuality and the creation of a very sort of general panic around witches committing infanticide. <clears throat> 
In a slightly later period of time, in the 18th century, when we get the establishment of all sorts of institutions that Foucault, uh, Michel Foucault referred to as biopolitical institutions, created to, uh, to, to, protect the, uh, to protect mothers. So in the 18th century is when we get the introduction of various uh, lying in hospitals where women can go to give birth. We get the introduction of laws regulating nurses' wages and all of this sort of stuff. So at the same time as we get this real institutional preoccupation on the part of the state, with making sure that we actually see the reproduction of a healthy workforce, this is the same time period in which uh, women, for the most part, the, the crime that they are most often punished for is the crime of infanticide. So the suggestion here is that there's a very specific relationship between the development of capitalism and the need to establish a workforce and the institutionalization of laws that, that regulate this, including the criminalization of women's control over reproduction. In my book, so I move past, I mean, part of that argument is, is covered by Federici, and I, and I look past this sort of focus on the witch hunts um, to look at a whole host of different laws that are used to produce gender-based uh, divisions and what we see when we do this is that women are being disciplined uh, not primarily as wage laborers, as a lot of people tend to assume, but increasingly, and more and more as capitalism develops, women are being disciplined to become mothers and to become housewives. So what we actually see, the argument that I make is that the laws used to create gender divisions between men and women to take up very specific positions in capitalist relations of production and social reproduction. And I have a number of different examples in the book that I won't get into, but just to give you a sense of the type of thing that I'm talking about, um, in England and North America, after the 19th century, you have a whole host of laws associated with uh, the poor laws and laws regulating uh, vagrancy and laws of settlement. And, and these laws are all sort of related laws that work to try to distinguish between the group of people who constitute the deserving poor and a group of people who constitute the undeserving poor. And the aim is to then encourage all of those who constitute the undeserving poor to work. So you get all sorts of draconian punishments that are used to punish workers who are undeserving. So workers who could potentially work but are not working. And so a lot of people, when they write about this, again, the, the sort of assumption is that what these laws served to do was to, to compel people to engage in wage labor. And there's a lot of talk about the poor laws now because, I mean, the argument that a lot of people make about neoliberalism is that we're seeing the return of the 19th century poor laws. So this harsh assumption that the majority of poor people are actually undeserving and they should be compelled through whatever means necessary to engage in wage labor rather than to rely on the state. But again, all of these arguments are assuming that what the state is doing is creating a class of wage laborers, whereas in fact, um, there are all sorts of distinctions that are made um, and exceptions that are made for not just women, but for women who adhere to very specific gendered norms of behavior. So if you're a woman who is married and is then widowed, you're considered to be part of the deserving poor. You don't necessarily have to work. But if you're a woman who has had a child out of wedlock, so you, you're not adhering to those gender norms, you're assumed to be the undeserving poor. And actually, it there's a belief and, and the state is going to compel these women to actually work uh, or enter into a poor house, or sorry, a workhouse. So again, you have the, the state actually working to create very specific differences here and to police gendered norms of behavior. <coughs> Another example is the legal doctrine of coverture which constructs husbands and wives as one unit of legal responsibility. And so through the laws of coverture, which exist all over Europe, uh, women are generally denied the right to enter into legal contracts. Um, but at the same time, the laws of coverture, which literally that translates uh, to uh, 
the laws of, of covered women. It prevents women from being punished by the state for all sorts of wrongdoing apart from treason. So the assumption on the part of the state is that if uh, women, the assumption on the part of the state is that husbands are actually going to discipline women. And if women commit crimes, if women engage in criminalized behavior, it's because husbands have allowed them to do so. They haven't done their job in disciplining women. So what those types of laws are doing are, again, assuming uh, that we have this patriarchal family unit and, and this form of punishment is, is designed around this sort of assumption. So within feminist writings in all sorts of different disciplines, we have really extensive debates about whether the development of capitalism has improved or worsened gender relations. So there are all of these debates. Have things gotten better or worse for women uh, throughout the development of capitalism? And I don't think that the answer to this question is particularly straightforward. So you have a lot of kind of moves that are contradictory, a lot of moves in both directions. But one of the things that I do show in this book is that a very particular change happens with the deepening of capitalism after the 19th century. So with the Industrial Revolution and the spread of capitalism, you see the criminalization, disciplining, and punishment of women, which used to happen in the public sphere, really coming to take place in the private sphere of the household. So the argument that I'm making here is that in contrast to the very early stages of capitalist development where the nuclear family isn't as well established and gender norms uh, that we now associate with capitalism haven't been as deeply rooted, it's only after the Industrial Revolution when capitalism develops and, and we get these real norms regarding the nuclear household and we get the uh, rise of bourgeois norms of femininity that, the, uh, that women essentially disappear from criminal justice statistics. So in the 18th century in England, you have something like 400 women who are hanged over a period of 50 years. And after that, by the 19th century, you get almost no public hangings, no executions of women. So you kind of have this disappearance of women from the criminal justice statistics. And this happens in part because, the, because women are being disciplined on the one hand through the nuclear family itself, but then on the other hand, they're disciplined through specific mechanisms of the welfare state. And I'm not really going to spend um, a lot of time talking about the welfare state here. I'm going to kind of move on and make some of the broader points that I wanted to make about neoliberalism. What we do know about the welfare state, and I mean a few things that are quite important to stay to, to, to note, is that the welfare state was obviously an incredibly gendered state. And feminist welfare state theorists have done excellent work that has really documented the ways in which the welfare state, while it was progressive to a certain extent, also reproduced very particular gendered norms of behavior and a very particular gender order based around the ideal of the male breadwinner. So what we know is that the welfare state designed all sorts of its policies around the assumption that males act as the main breadwinner and women are economically dependent on men. Welfare state theorists tend to spend less time talking about how gendered norms are reproduced through the state's criminal justice apparatus, but it actually does a very similar type of thing. So during the period of the welfare state, um, when women commit crimes, they tend to be treated more leniently than men are. They're put in reformatories where they're taught to be proper women. They're given skills of uh, cooking and cleaning. They're taught to do needlework and things like that. They're, they're trained to be kind of good uh, bourgeois, for future bourgeois housewives. And, and this is problematic for all sorts of reasons. But what happens with the transition from the welfare state 
to neoliberalism is that these particular forms of gender difference that were a part of the welfare state are actually undermined uh, so that we have the restructuring of welfare state systems in ways that women are increasingly treated uh, the same as men. So we have these assumptions that all women should be uh, workers, for instance, and we see this most dramatically with cuts to provisioning for single mothers um, and things like that. So there's an assumption that even if you have children, you are still expected to work. So there's little attention, there's little kind of differentiation paid there. And at the same time, you're seeing under neoliberalism the restructuring of all sorts of aspects of prisons and, and policing in similar types of ways. So women's prisons are increasingly being redesigned to look like men's prisons. You have particular cases like in uh, Arizona, famously, where the sheriff in Arizona um, had women uh, working in chain gangs along the side of the road. He was saying, we will be an equal opportunity incarcerator. So feminist criminologists have actually called this equality with a vengeance. And they're saying that the kind of rise of this rational actor who's the subject of both welfare and criminal policy has very particular types of gendered effects, which are not better or worse, but are different from the types of gendered relations that were supported by the welfare state. The sort of general framework that I set up in my historical analysis and what I apply to the case of neoliberalism is a kind of theoretical and analytical framework that says that if we want to understand the behavior of the state, and again, I mean, I'm interested in the state's criminal justice policy, but if we want to understand all sorts of aspects of neoliberalism, that we need to look at relations of production and social reproduction. So in any particular moment, if we look at the gendered relations of, excuse me, production and social reproduction, this will help us understand what's going on in the rest of society. So what I argue in the two chapters of the book that focus on neoliberalism is that there are all sorts of changes associated with the restructuring of relations of production that have gendered effects that are leading to the growing criminalization of women, uh, as well as the restructuring of relations of social reproduction. So to explain what I mean here, this <coughs> rise of the punitive arm of the state, where it is discussed in the literature, it's so people like, I'm not sure if anyone um, has read any of the work of this sociologist, Loic Vacant, who's written a lot about this sort of neoliberal governance of criminality and, and poverty. And the argument that Loic Vacant makes, which is quite an um, impressive and, and convincing argument that he makes in a number of different books, but he tends to understand this rise in the punitive governance of poverty as being a ruling class response to the social insecurities that have been brought about by neoliberal capitalism, namely through processes that include the decline of manufacturing and the undermi undermining of traditional jobs, the erosion of the social welfare provisioning, the solidification of class divisions, et cetera, et cetera. So again, he understands this as being a ruling class response to the poverty created by neoliberalism. And what I'm arguing here is that with the lens that looks not only at the restructuring of class relations and the decline of manufacturing, uh, but if we also look at how social reproduction has been restructured, then we see that this isn't just about class politics, it's not just about racial politics, but this is uh, integrally a matter of gender politics. So what's going on is not just an attempt on the part of the state to manage growing class and racial inequalities, but actually in a part uh, an attempt on the part of the state to manage men and women and those with non-conforming gender identities in the context of the breakdown of the male breadwinner gender order, which has come with neoliberal restructuring. So to make the two points that I want to make here, I mean, again, if we think about, so how is neoliberalism restructured social, repro uh, how is it restructured 
production, so relations of production. And I think this is a story that a lot of us are familiar with. We've seen the undermining of a lot of traditional types of jobs. We've seen the shrinking of many opportunities uh, for standard forms of employment. Um, we've seen the rise of uh, financialization and with that the decline of certain uh, manufacturing in particular countries. We've seen um, you know, the growing precariousness of labor in all sorts of different ways. Feminist political economists have drawn attention to not only those dynamics, but at the same time, they've tried to think about the ways in which this has had implications for women's work and has led to actually a growing importance of women's work in the global economy. So people like uh, Saskia Sassen, for instance, has written about what she calls the feminization of survival. And this has to do with the ways in which all of these things that I was just talking about, shrinking opportunities for male employment, the growing precariousness of labor, um, along with actually struggles on the part of feminists to be able to uh, engage in waged work in various sorts of ways has, has led to a, a shift in labor dynamics. So women have become more and more important to the reproduction of their families, to the reproduction of national economies, and they've become more and more important to the global economy in general. And part of this involves not just the growing entry of women into the labor force and the, the feminization of labor migration. So we're seeing more and more women um, as, as migrants, particularly in uh, domestic work. Um, so, so those sorts of contributions, the remittances that these women send home has become increasingly important for the survival of their communities and their families. But at the same time, these sorts of processes of the feminization of survival have led to the rise of women's participation in particular forms of criminalized work. So in particular, uh, in, when she writes about this, Saskia Sassen talks about the rising importance of prostitution and drug, and drug trafficking. And what I argue in this book is that this notion of the feminization of survival, the fact that more and more women have to engage in this sort of work in order to secure the reproduction of their families and their communities and their national economies, helps to explain why more and more women are uh, being incarcerated. So the way that I make this argument in the book is to look in particular at the rise in women's drug trafficking. And we've seen a number of studies that have shown that women involved in drug trafficking and drug-related activities are motivated by a need to support themselves and or their families in the context of limited options for survival. So women are engaging in more and more criminalized activities because of these forms of globalized restructuring. At the same time, so if that's sort of thinking about how the restructuring of relations of production have led women to engage in more criminalized activities, you can also focus on the restructuring of relations of social reproduction. So under neoliberalism, social reproduction has been increasingly uh, privatized and what some people refer to as, as being refamil, ref, I'm not going to be able to say it, refamilia, familialized. So social reproduct, the work of social reproduction is increasingly returning to the family through the retreat of the welfare state. So as more and more aspects of the welfare state are being uh, privatized, then a lot of this work is being done increasingly within the family. Um, for people who are able to afford it, a lot of this work is being paid for on the market. So that's kind of simultaneous commodification and refamiliarization of social reproduction that's taking place. What we've actually seen from a number of different studies, so there are studies that look at the U.S. in particular, so doing comparative analysis of different states in the U.S., but there are studies that have looked at, have done comparative studies of the OECD countries in general, and what they've shown is that we actually have a correlation 
between states that engage in welfare retrenchment and the rise in women's imprisonment. So what we see very clearly in the statistics is that those states that spend less money on social welfare are more likely to have higher prison populations. So again, the point is that the restructuring of social reproduction in these particular ways is, is leading to the criminalization of women. And the, the last point that I want to make about how social reproduction is being restructured under neoliberalism has to do with its financialization. And this is something I'm not sure if people were here. Yesterday I was listening to the talk uh, by Kostas Lapovitsas, and, and, he, and he starts to get at this process a little bit when he talks about and when he writes about the ways in which part of financialization, part of this broader trend of this thing that we call financialization, has involved the uh, growing indebtedness of households, right? So part of the broader extension of finance has been the growing uh, financialization of households themselves. And what, this is related to a number of different things, but I think it's important to think about household debt as being uh, intricately linked to the declining ability of households to be able to actually meet their reproductive needs. So depending on which countries that you look at, um, in the United States, growing indebtedness is very much linked to healthcare debt, right? As um, it's not even a reprivatization. I mean, the American healthcare system has always been a privatized system. But as families aren't able to meet the costs of healthcare, they have to go into more and more debt in order to be able to afford this. In all three countries, we see families going into massive amounts of debt in order to pay for education, as states are rolling back subsidies for post-secondary education. Families are going into debt for these reasons. We see families going into debt um, in order to pay for food, in order to pay in the UK, there's um, a huge amount of, of debt uh, within the working poor uh, segment of the population that's related to um, inability to pay electric bills. So, so people are going into debt in order to meet these costs of social reproduction that they are no longer able to meet just by working. Uh, Lapavistas in his talk also made the point, and it's a really important point, that part of this debt is related to mortgage debt. So in all three countries that I look at, Canada, the US, and the UK, households have taken on an increasing amount of mortgage debt. And the argument that I make in the book, and I've, and I've made this in some of my other writing as well, is that housing more and more in these countries, so in countries that people refer to as uh, ownership societies, where owning your own house is privileged by the government through both ideological campaigns that tell us that it's important to own homes, but also through very particular types of policies that give people incentives to buy their own homes. So housing in all three of these countries is not seen as something that's a social right, um, but more and more housing is understood in terms of being a financial asset. The counterpart to this focus of the state on promoting private home ownership. And again, the US is the best example of this because they have this very particular tax deduction called the mortgage interest tax deduction, whereby people can deduct interest paid on their mortgage. I mean, the explanation is in the name. But this costs a, a, a massive amount of money. It's a massive state subsidy to people who own their own homes. And Canada and the UK are slightly different, but they also have uh, all sorts of policies that are designed to offer state support for people to buy their own homes. So we've got a massive subsidization of the middle classes um, and, and the rich there. The counterpart to all of this investment and interest in promoting private home ownership has been an undermining of social support for housing. So in the UK, we've seen, I mean, it started in Margaret Thatcher, but we've seen renewed bouts of the sell-off of council housing, 
In the United States, they started really privatizing their social housing stock in the 1980s, um, and that's been systematically going through a process of privatization ever since. So in all three of the countries, you see this treatment of housing, which is a central aspect of social reproduction. It's being treated as a financial asset instead of a social right, and, and the social provisioning of housing has been undermined. So these are, to me, they're, they're part of the, the same type of a process. And what this has led to then in all three cases is a massive increase in precarious living situations and, and to massive increases in, in homelessness. And again, it depends on which particular country you're looking at, but in London you've seen huge rises in homelessness where I live in Manchester. And this is stuff that's been intensified through austerity policies, but they have a longer historical trajectory than that. Where I live in Manchester, you've seen in recent years huge um, camping communities being set up along the side of roads, you know, massive increases in homelessness in all three countries. But instead of this being treated as the social problem that it is, in all of these cases, we've seen the increasing criminalization of homelessness. So the way that the state has dealt with the fallout of this process of financialization is by criminalizing those who have been most negatively impacted. So you see all sorts of bans on uh, begging, you see new laws that are introduced to criminalize squatting. We've seen bans, like what I was talking about, those PISVOs that have been introduced to prevent people from camping in public spaces that criminalize uh, loitering. There are, there are lots of different examples. But the argument is that through this process of financializing social reproduction, it creates very particular social dislocations, and those dislocations are actually being addressed by the state's criminal uh, justice apparatus. And I'm really interested uh, about whether or not we can draw anything from this sort of discussion, uh, if there's anything that, that we can, any way that we can relate it to what's going on in in Croatia, I was doing some reading before coming here about homelessness in Croatia, and it's, and it's quite interesting because according to what I read, there isn't homelessness in Croatia. Um, not very much of it anyway, um, and, and this is a, is, is a legacy of, uh, of, of communism and, and the particular way that capitalism has developed here, and it seems to be the case, and particularly here in Zagreb, um, that there actually is a growing homeless problem, but this seems to be something that's actually being addressed through welfare policies rather than through criminalization. So it could be the case that there's a very sort of different um, path that's being followed here, which has to do with, again, the, the legacy and the type of capitalism that's being introduced in Croatia. But there are other examples, um, such as in, in Hungary, where actually the government in 2013 just passed a law making it criminal to sleep in public places and to dumpster dive. And there are places in Budapest where you can go to jail if you fail to pay fines for being homeless. So clearly there are some places where these types of policies are being introduced as well. So the point that I'm trying to make then is that through this sort of lens that focuses on relations of production and social reproduction, it's a lens that pays attention to the gendered dimensions of poverty. Uh, this, this sort of lens helps us to understand not only how the impacts of neoliberal restructuring are felt along class and gendered lines, but also the ways in which this fuels very particular types of uh, criminality and responses of criminalization on the part of the state. And I think that this sort of lens is what really helps us to understand these types of incarceration statistics that I started out by talking about. To conclude with the sort of question that I think any analysis of this sort begs, where do we go from here? You know, what is all of this saying about, uh, about the future? I mean, I think going back to a point that E.P. Thompson made, um, if anyone's read E.P. Thompson, a uh, great Marxist historian who wrote a lot about the law, 
he had a very particular argument that said that the law has to maintain some sort of legitimacy. Otherwise, it doesn't do what it needs to do as the law. And the very fact that the law needs to maintain some sort of legitimacy makes it a site where social contestation can take place. And I think there are all sorts of resistances and forms of contestation that we can identify that have emerged in response to all of these processes of criminalization. And again, I mean, Lots of examples come to mind from the United States, all sorts of responses to uh, racist policing and incarceration, Black Lives Matter and, and those types of movements come to mind. But we see lots of movements historically. We see lots of broader movements uh, against the prison industrial complex, against the privatization of, of prisons. I think all sorts of resistances that we've seen in response to the policing of migrants at various European borders. You know, all of these are examples of the incredible social contestation that exists in response to these particular exertions of state power. But part of the argument that I make in my book, I mean, what I think is important to draw from the analysis is that as important as these types of contestations are, because the criminal justice apparatus policing the law are central to the very creation of capitalism. They are always used to secure and reproduce capitalism and its gendered social forms that any sort of resistance against forms of policing, for instance, needs to, I would argue, be rooted in an anti-capitalist resistance or it risks at best kind of promoting uh, a return to something that more closely resembles the welfare state type era and never actually gets past the very fact that capitalism is always involved in a process of creating uh, social marginality. And so these types of resistances really need to, I think, push their um, analysis and have more radical long-term objectives. Thank you. We are opening floor for the questions. Are there any? Okay, I'll start then. Um, we talked the other day um, about the concept of patriarchy. And I'm wondering, even Lise Vogel tell us like two years ago that it's a, it's a concept everybody use, but nobody actually knows what does it mean. So, um, and you also said that it's a limited concept, when you're, even when we are talking about the attack on, on social reproduction in, capitalist, in, in capitalism. So maybe you can comment. You have to go right for the difficult <laughs> question, don't you? What is patriarchy and the relationship between capitalism and patriarchy? I mean, it's, it's an excellent question and the response that I gave to you a couple of days ago, I think is one that I would still stick with, which is basically that I am not sure what the concept of patriarchy does for the type of analysis that I'm trying to put forward. And part of the reason that I think that's the case is has to do with the way that particular feminists can sometimes rely on the concept of patriarchy to do all sorts of analytical work that I don't think it actually does. So if we're using the concept of patriarchy to refer to uh, men's dominance over women, for instance, I think that there are ways that we can be more specific about what that dominance looks like, uh, how inequalities are reproduced in particular times and places. And I'm not always sure in the way that patriarchy is used that it has that sort of analytical power. Part of this just has to do with the particular type of feminism that I was trained in, which is a very particular Canadian school of 
uh, feminist political economy where the concept of social reproduction is really used to do a lot of this type of, of, of work. Um, so while on the one hand I think that capitalism emerges historically as a system in a context where gender inequality already exists, capitalism creates very specific forms of gender difference and it reproduces very particular gender hierarchies for very particular purposes. And that's the type of analysis that I'm trying to put forward in this book, which has to do with the specificity not only of um, capitalist relations of gender inequality, but how in different moments of capitalism and even in different uh, places, how those relationships are actually constituted. And I think in approaching the question like that, it gives us a bit more room to think about some of the contradictions in moves toward gender equality and simultaneously back away from gender equality. And, and I'm not always sure that a concept of patriarchy gives us that sort of analytical precision. But I know that's controversial, so. <laughs> I think you kind of, I think you gave the definition as it should be because there is no simple definition as you said, but since you started telling me if I could just quote you what you briefly said, that um, if capitalism forms um, a different or specific hierarchy, so does anything what we would define that hierarchy or the power disbalance is what is in the roots of patriarchy. So, it depends like exactly what you said, from which point you start defining. And of course, then you do it from your framework and what's more interesting or what's your interest so that you just stick to the main core of, of the things you are interested. Thank you very much. It was a really wonderful lecture. And it's, I wish there was more of us listening. And we don't have often occasion, especially to, to deal with a feminist uh, insight into capitalism. Um, I wanted you a little bit to comment, it fits in what you um, talked um, about more state control, police control, um, concerning the migrations that we had. I remember in the early 90s working with uh, women refugees from uh, Bosnia and Herzegovina that uh, then, although we were still more in a phase of welfare state, especially what we considered the old Europe and the West, including Canada, that for me, I was in shock seeing that in the applications for the status, it was of course um, counted that women who, uh, whose uh, husbands has been killed or pronounced missing in Srebrenica didn't, and had, let's say, two kids, didn't get the status, refugee status for Canada. Of course, nobody said that there was a fear that immediately, that they are not capable to work, but that they would be on the social welfare or something. So for me, it was shocked that demand was, and it was counted only historically that men would have such a position. It was written that the right to status had those who fear of prosecution. So in a sense, you wanted women to be a political human, be, uh, political beings, but they were just, um, I would say, simple majority were just simple peasant women from villages. And what we only could uh, do as a subversive act when we saw that they were not accepted, so we were writing them uh, stories that eventually they have been subversive and that they really feared of prosecution. So as you said, sometimes you have to fear of prosecution and then eventually the states are punishing you. So how would you comment how as a woman you never properly fit? I do, you, why they, women would tell us, but I, want, I don't want to be on social welfare in Canada. I want to support my kids. 
So um, it's still so deeply rooted, this notion and the division of labor, uh, how it is kind of cemented over the centuries, that it is not even seen when there is a situation of uh, pleading refugees. And I think that most probably the same situation, we don't have experience in Croatia, many women refugees are facing that we have these gendered kind of migration issues too. It's more to comment than just... Yeah, I mean, thanks for sharing that. I don't have an awful lot to comment on it. I mean, it, it seems to me, and, and correct me if I'm sort of misunderstanding it, but part of what is going on there, and I, and I think you see this now in all sorts of countries in, in the context of deciding which refugees to accept and not accept. I mean, there is again an, an assumption that they only want to accept particular groups of refugees who are going to engage in a particular type of labor that is going to contribute to the national economy in a very particular sort of a way. So these sorts of family reunification policies which are incredibly in a, com commonsensical, um, have really been undermined in, in recent years. And the objective really seems to be one of states willing to take on that labor, that productive labor, while at the same time making sure that the social reproductive labor and in those cases where the families uh, were both you know family members are alive but in different places making sure that that social reproductive labor is taking place in a different place in a different country and the costs of that are being borne by a different country even though you know remittances are sent back and we know that remittances are incredibly important for GDP of a number of, of different countries but that spatial separation of, of social reproduction um, becomes very useful for those states that will take on the costs of well, the benefits of productive labor mm -hmm. without taking on the costs of the reproductive labor. It's an oversimplification of a much more complex phenomenon. And of course, the same with the Scandinavian cases. Questions? We'll take some comments and disagreements, arguments. Disagreements and arguments always. I think people are tired. The, the panel before was exhausting. Um, all male panel. Then we can close uh, the floor and discussion for today and, uh, and, and discuss it over a drink. Thank you for coming. Thank you, Adrienne. Thank you very much.